The fascination fans have had with the vaults of the world of Fallout has existed ever since we were introduced to them. Isolated environments where the strangest of experiments were carried out on a, more often than not, ignorant vault population. Or at least a large portion of them were. Why the vaults became this, despite their promise of safety and security, was something we had to speculate on for the most part. vault Tech simply using their unsuspecting residents as guinea pigs for whatever took their fancy was the overt reason that one would always come to. But the true purpose or true goal of the vaults, and the reasoning behind how the secret experiments took shape, for the most part, was unknown to us. Any answers existed in the realm of speculation. But with the Fallout TV series, we actually got a pretty concrete answer. We are shown a trinity of vaults, 31, 32 and 33, all seemingly thriving and happy after over two centuries. Initially, we get our hopes up that this time it's different. Maybe it's a vault that actually did its job, or it was a control vault, a sanity baseline against which all the other nightmare scenarios were compared against. Nope. The wool is very harshly torn from our eyes and subsequently shoved down our throats over the course of eight episodes. vault Tech showed that even when their vault preserved the lives of thousands of people over two centuries, they somehow still managed to undertake horrific actions behind the scenes that outweighed all of this, that continued the horrific trend of there always being a dark underbelly to a vault and an ulterior purpose. Today we'll talk in detail about vaults 31, 32 and 33, going over everything that was shown to us. A warning before we start, this video has massive spoilers for the show, obviously. Additionally, since there's still much we don't know, and we do discuss things only mentioned in passing, or that people consider plot holes, this video will be speculation heavy. I know all my videos have speculation, but even so this one has it, in spades. If you enjoy it and want to see more content on the show, leave a like and a comment. If you want to discuss theories in the comment section, please do so, but keep it civil. Now, let's get into this unholy trinity of vaults. From the very first scene we are shown of Vault 31, we can tell that, in regards to quality, it really is a cut above the rest. Granted, what we see is usually the aftermath of a prolonged period of human suffering, so the bar is totally in the shit, but it's still an impressive setup. When we're introduced to Lucy during her marriage application, and don't worry, we'll get to that, she gives us a full rundown of the quality of life and amenities they seem to have access to. The first thing to note is that, even after 219 years, the vault is still stable enough that things like self-improvement and recreation are actually options to them. Yes, we've encountered other vaults that were still functioning after two centuries, such as 101, but compared to them, this one is far ahead. Of particular note are the self-defense and marksmanship classes. Now, we have seen some firearms training in 101, but that was mostly informal from the Lone Wanderer's father, and throwing hands with the tunnel snakes doesn't count as self-defense training. But here, from what we saw, it was very advanced. It looked like judo, maybe sambo, but I can't be sure. Moreover, she mentioned she was only intermediary, which implies there were practitioners of an even higher level than this. I expect this is one of the factors that contributed to the overall victory against the raiders, but we'll get to that. The marksmanship training was also very formalized, being one of the many paths of self-improvement that an individual could take to make themselves stand out, to increase their own merit. One thing I did find odd is that, if this was an option for over two centuries, how do they still have any bullets left? Even if they were still using blanks, I would expect them to have run out. It could be that only certain individuals could take part, which would keep the numbers down, or it was a new class introduced in preparation of them leaving the vaults, or as a result of Hank's experiences outside the vault. But if that wasn't the case, the fact they still have supplies after all this time is strange. But more on that in detail later. Education in this vault also seems to be a priority. Now, at least in the aspect of scientific knowledge, they clearly impart as much as they can. What the upper bound on Lucy's competency is, we don't know, though given Hank was somehow able to detonate nuclear ordnance to wipe out the NCR, had at least some knowledge of the cold fusion technology, worked for vault -Tec, and was ultimately chosen by Bud, which implies a high level of competency. We could assume she's just being modest when she says she isn't as competent as her dad, or she doesn't seem to realise how competent she is in comparison to pretty much everyone outside the vaults. She herself was involved in educating the younger generation, I expect that it's here that the goals of the vault are imprinted on them, and where their exposure to the meritocracy aspects we will be discussing begins. I have to wonder whether the history that she teaches is actually all that accurate. A bit of revisionism seems likely, especially given the goal was to essentially engineer the perfect humans to carry on the will and ideologies of Altec, or as Bud Askins puts it, to win the great game of capitalism. Due to this, I wouldn't be all that surprised if some of the shortcomings of vault ideology that revolved almost entirely around capitalism were either glossed over or outright omitted, 
one of the larger likely being how the greed of people in the latter half of the 21st century caused the resource shortages, and ultimately the war, that destroyed the whole world. With a little help from our friendly neighborhood Voltec, of course. This also likely played a role in the decision to both educate people in science and combat. If they were to emerge into the world, they'd need to be as prepared as possible to outmaneuver and outperform the competition. And in the end, as we saw in the show and we'll discuss today, this was the ultimate goal of the experiment. Or at least it was from Bud's point of view. Could they create the ultimate managers and worker bees? And when they emerged onto the surface, could they conquer it? Showing that vault ideals were the best way. But coming back to the opening scene, it's here we're introduced to one of the oldest customs of the trinity of vaults. The triannual exchange. A way to introduce new blood into a vault and foster cooperation, camaraderie and the exchange of resources and ideas. Or at least, on the surface, it appears to be the case. It also seems to have served as a means to trade between the vaults, but we'll come back to the topic of supplies later. Given the review panel that Lucy was engaging in when she applied, and how prepared she was, it would appear that only the most exceptional candidates are given the opportunity to go to the other vaults. Or at least ones meeting a certain criteria, which could also be the polar opposite of exceptional. Since she, by her own admission, stated she wasn't successful in finding a partner inside the vault, this was likely set up so they could control whether or not undesirable characteristics, or people, were able to pass on their genetics to the next generation. If someone was incapable of finding a partner, this could likely mean one of two things. They had, in the eyes of everyone else in the vault, little merit, or something about them was undesirable, or they did have merit and excelled in one or more areas, and they were just either unsuccessful or had higher standards, whether those standards were valid or not. In either case, the panel could then act as a final filter and only choose the candidate that they felt met their standards or needs at the time. This would allow them to get rid of anyone they weren't particularly sure suited the vaults or was otherwise a drain on resources due to them possibly not contributing enough to offset their inability to contribute to the next generation. The other vault would take them off their hands and they in turn would get someone they could pair up with one of their own, all going back to the Darwinian nature of the vaults. Additionally, given Lucy's mention of sperm count, whether or not you were likely able to produce children played a large role. Hank literally used the word breeder, so it was definitely a prerequisite, which makes sense, as one more person in the vaults with no ability to increase the overall population for the next generation wouldn't make a lot of sense. They'd just be one more body that would possibly deprive a future inhabitant of a place in the vault. Except in the specific circumstance where a particular skill set was required or desired by another vault, as we saw in some of the trade logs that Norm was looking at later. On the topic of the panel that made the decision, it was comprised entirely of the council at the time, a secondary ruling body beneath Hank McLean. More importantly, a member of Vault 31, Betty, was on it. Now as we find out later, she was the secretary of Barb Howard. This raises two questions. Was a member of Vault 31 always on these panels? And did the voting actually work? We'll get into the overseer voting process later, and the true control exercised by Vault 31. But due to the supposed anonymous nature of the voting, if Betty voted yes, would the other votes have even mattered? Or does her being from Vault 31 automatically mean that her approval means the trade goes through? Additionally, Hank may have decided Lucy would be successful, and as a result she would have always been chosen. Not to say she wouldn't have been chosen if this wasn't the case, but it is important to raise the question of how valid any voting was in general in this vault, in the face of a vote from a Vault 31 member. If this was the case, it could mean that all intervault trades were conducted only with the approval of Vault 31 plants. Another possibility is that trade votes weren't anonymous, but because everyone just followed the lead of those from Vault 31, as they were conditioned to, the other two went along with it. We don't know whether the council were the only ones ever involved in this decision either. It could be that Hank would generally play a role, but couldn't due to a conflict of interest, Lucy being his daughter and all. Something else that links into the trade is the population. First off, we do see a large amount of people, both at the wedding and the meeting regarding the raiders. We also know this wasn't everyone, as we saw a lot of people from the younger generation when we were showing Lucy teaching, and at least some people would have had duties they couldn't be excused from. But even taking that into account, what we see is not the massive population you'd expect after two centuries of unrestricted growth, not even close. Throughout the series we've been given information on the population of a lot of vaults, generally it's between 100 to 500 people. Even taking into account the seeding of new people from Vault 31 over the years, you'd need a large population to get started to maintain diversity. Yet for all that, the number seems to have stayed the same. Either that or the overall population is far larger than we're shown, and would be in the thousands by now if that was the case. But if that were true, this would have strong implications for the overall size of the vault. After her wedding, we see Lucy and her supposed husband enter their new home. Now since the point of the exchange was to contribute to the next generation, 
it would likely be the case that everyone who leaves gets a new home with their new partner. But this means that, at least in the case of 33 and 32, the vaults would have to be expansive enough that there's enough room for a new couple in one of them every three years. Excluding Vault 31, we can assume that which vault would get to make a trade for new personnel was rotated every three years, which means you'd be losing one person in one trade and gaining one in another. Overall, this would seem to even out, but you have to take into account the life expectancy and how many children people were having. Now given that there was only so much space and resources, it's reasonable to conclude that there was a cap on how many you were allowed to have. I'd say this because if a pair entered the vaults and had children, and those children grew up, at some point they'd need the space to raise their own families. We saw quite a few elderly in the vaults, so it's safe to assume, I think, that people were living at least to their 70s. In this case, you'd eventually be running out of housing for new couples entering the vaults, or for people already in the vault who had paired up and would be moving out of their parents' houses to start their own families. If there wasn't a careful control in the population, then I can only conclude that the vaults were fucking massive. Projections to how high the vault would go over several centuries would have had to have been taken into account with the construction, and the size of the vaults would reflect this. In this case, that would mean a large number of inactive spaces in the vaults that were ready to be occupied. I think the numbering on the mailboxes backs this up. Assuming the first number is the floor, not the actual numerical amount of houses, then Lucy's new home was on floor 6. Given the focus on family in this vault, it's a reasonable assumption that a good portion of people were in relationships and had children. Due to this, if they were placed in the next available house, hundreds should be occupied. We aren't going to talk about it today, but I think Vault 4 was a good example of this. They already had a thriving population, and then they took in people from Shady Sands and others in large numbers. Yet they were still able to give rooms to Magnus and Lucy, with pretty much no hesitation. So it could also be the case here. Otherwise, as I stated, population control would have to be happening. One way they could be achieving this is through the crops, or the supposed disasters in the vaults, which we'll get to later. The power of the vaults is an interesting topic as well. We see, during Lucy's interview, that there is some class or activity used to supplement power using electricity generated by bicycles. Now, whether this was introduced out of necessity, or just another way to keep people in the vault fit, I'm not sure. But if it was a necessity, that could imply the vault was facing an issue with its power source. Vault 4 seemed to only have the one fusion core, but then again they weren't necessarily a vault meant to last through the centuries. Or at the very least the population was never meant to reach the level it has, with Vault 4 opening its doors, so to speak. So they could have run out quicker than predicted as demands exceeded predictions. Vaults 31 to 33 were different, them lasting centuries was a given, or at least the vault tech employees in them thought so, along with Bud Askins. vault tech was not above experimenting on their own, so the vaults could have had another, secret experiment or goal or had some faults built in that would introduce hardship or scarcity, which I actually do think is the case, as we'll get to. But circling back to the bikes, it was a way to supplement power that I can't recall having come across in other vaults. In my opinion, the most likely explanation is a scheme introduced to cut down on Drain from their supply. Speaking of supplies, as I mentioned earlier, this vault had a very strange abundance of them, as I already touched on with the ammunition. Yes, it is possible they just had that much, but during the raider attack we saw the armory, and that didn't appear to be the case, which means they either have a surplus of supplies stashed away somewhere in a storage section of the vaults, or the trade aspect of the triannual exchange was a lot more than just ceremony, it was essential. We saw that they still had new Coca-Cola over two centuries later. Now this on its own isn't too strange, lots of places still do, but their vault hasn't been open to the outside world, and Norm seemed to just be able to use the machine with no special access. This would seem to indicate that they were just that, vending machines anyone could use. Moreover, as we saw at the wedding and in the apartments, food and water were incredibly plentiful as well. This again comes back to the size of the vaults and the projections for how long they would be there. They could have been stocked so well that they had enough supplies to last the whole of the two centuries, but then why would they need to have the trade at the triangle exchange? The answer is probably both to continue the cooperation between the vaults and the limited circulation of certain items. In the meeting with the heads of the other most powerful corporations in America, Bud says the vaults had enough supplies to last centuries. I think this pretty much confirms that there had to have been some limit on the goods that were available at any one time, especially when we learn later about how famine or blight have been actual issues in the past. Yet somehow they still seem to have pre-war goods in enough supply that rationing doesn't seem to be in place, at least in a day-to-day. -day. So there was some limit on the amount of pre-war supplies, and most importantly, seeds and spare parts. I think this was an intentional design by management to ensure they would need to depend on one another for resources, as if they didn't, the exchange of personnel could stop. What I mean by this is that if the population of Vault 32 and 33 were already fairly high, there wouldn't be an immediate threat of inbreeding. 
Moreover, due to the cousin kissing that was introduced, pregnancies resulting from relations between people before they can pair up and have the children they get permission to have was probably quite low. As we discussed with the population, they still had a good enough size where they may, at some point, decide to stop the exchange. Maybe not immediately, or even permanently, but enough to possibly threaten the overall unity. And since the experiment was to create the perfect little vault tech workers, well, that sort of insubordination needs to be stopped. So you make the trade a necessity. Hank stated they would give spare parts and seed in exchange for a breeder. Given all the other food and supplies they have, these two can assume to be the most tightly controlled items. Parts to make sure the vault stays functional and pristine, which, as we saw, it is. And seed for their crop fields that served a few purposes, not the least of which was self-sufficiency and an avoidance of dependence on the supply of pre-war goods. Limiting the supply of these two would ensure they would have a motive, beyond genetic diversity, for continuing the exchange. If these items were being limited, then the supply of parts most likely came from Vault 31. They could have periodically introduced them into circulation when they traded with the other vaults. The only problem with this is how exactly did they bring up reasons for a parts trade. Hank did it with 32 so they could get a new person into the vaults. He could have offered the trade of parts and seed due to the supposed crop failure that happened in Vault 32 two years prior. In which case they may not always trade items, and there would likely be no scarcity or control. But if the trade aspect was a constant thing, then given Vault 31 always seemed to be the one trading its residents, how did they ever get the opportunity to give anything away? I've got a lot of speculation on this, but then, if you've watched this far, you've already sat through a shed load of it. The first option is that people did enter Vault 31, like Norm did, during the trade. We'll talk more later about how this would even happen, given the ceremony involved and, you know, the world's most spiteful Roomba being unable to let people see him. But however the trade happened, after the Vault 32 or 33 resident entered the vault, they were probably either killed or put to sleep. This would allow the large surplus of supplies Vault 31 may have had to trickle out into the vault. Especially given Bud has few requirements being a bargain bin Robobrain. Both vaults would be able to get what they needed, the exchanges would continue, and maybe a bit of population control was being carried out. One person from each vault was killed every time they traded with Vault 31. Option 2 is that, due to the limited contact between the vaults, none of them, or at least those not from 31, were aware of the fact that people only seemed to come out of Vault 31, not go into it. Due to this, they never put it together that supplies flowed in and never flowed out. This could have caused a scarcity or at least a net loss for each vault, so they needed to continue the trades with each other to replenish what they were missing. This scarcity would have been engineered by Vault 31, by Bud, possibly going back into his whole goal of wanting the most capable managers and those who could survive when there was a scarcity would qualify. Engineered catastrophes seemed a constant in these vaults, directly related to the seeding of Vault 31 residents as overseers, except in the case of Moldaver. I think Norm looking at the hacked logs of exchange records between the vaults backs this up. In almost all the cases, Vault 31 sent a resident, and as we'll soon talk about, that resident was promptly elected as overseer. But in all these instances, goods went into Vault 31, Sometimes people, if the technical expertise section of the entry was anything to go on, so we don't really have a solid example of a person being traded into Vault 31 for goods. However, the logs Norm reads also seem to indicate that other trades did occur. This implies the exchange may very well not have been only limited to that of people, but other resources. This also makes sense as if someone had to put themselves forward for an exchange via the panel, if no one chose to, well then they'd have nobody to trade. How would they then be able to get the resources they needed? The answer is that other trades were possible during the exchange. Now I briefly mentioned the crops. From Dr. Wilzig's comment, the crop fields were a staple of Vault 33, and from what we saw, 32 as well, something that was integral to their design. On the surface, this offers a good way to avoid massive amounts of supplies being needed. They could just grow their own food. As we saw with the raiders, they do have compost, likely from recycled waste. It could also be the case that their dead were also utilized as fertilizer, but we can't be sure. Given there's literally a room set aside and this would need to have been taken into consideration before the vault was finished, the crops were always going to be part of the life here. It also allowed the introduction and driving home of the values they would use to control people, such as hard work, contributing to the whole, and reminding them, especially with a projector, about the world they were working towards. But besides the advantage of another, somewhat, sustainable food source, I think there was another purpose. Control, especially given Hank's comment about Vault 32 and what we saw in there. When we get to Vault 32, we'll discuss it more. But for now, I think that perhaps Bud in Vault 31, or management in general, had more control over the crops than was known, and may have used them as a means to cause division and catastrophe. To give the people something to fear, and look for strong leadership. A firm hand at the helm. Remember, if things are glum, 
Vote Vault 31. The overall mannerisms of the people here are very apple pie, shucksy doodle dandy, we're all in a cult. And not a fun one, like the one in Vault 4, where you get your baps out. They talk about the greater good, and their overall purpose and goal of saving the world. Lucy literally lectured a shopkeeper about this after accusing her of being a thief. This slightly holier-than-thou attitude seems to stem from the kool they've been drinking, and the constant indoctrination they're subjected to. Likely as we said, it starts with the younger generation, teaching them their version of history and about the responsibility they have to one day restore the world. This was likely a big reason why their meritocracy hasn't collapsed after all this time, why people haven't lost hope or sight of their goal. Well, that and the plants from Vault 31. However, despite all this, they come off as incredibly ignorant about the outside world. At the ceremony, Hank states that readings seem to indicate that the next generation will be able to emerge into the world and begin rebuilding. At the beginning of the series, this is a statement that does come off as incredibly ignorant, and a mistake we've seen a few vaults make. If memory serves, the Robobrains of Vault 118 thought the outside world was still too irradiated, and they had to wait it out. Then again, they aren't the best example, as they were literally going insane, albeit on an extended, drawn-out timescale. Now, later on we learn that not only did he know the outside world was habitable, it had been for a very long time, as far back as 2142, at least in regards to the NCR. His reason for keeping people inside and the ultimate murdering of his wife, or as good as, along with tens of thousands of others, was all for the goal of winning Armageddon. He didn't want them to have to go out and compete with others. He wanted everyone else to be gone, to have killed each other, and for them to emerge victorious. This was the whole goal, as we're told by Bud. Let the apex predator, time, wipe out the competition. Though in the case of Shady Sands, Hank felt it necessary to employ the same tactics vault had before the war. Now whether or not Hank knew before Rose went out into the world, we can't be sure. At the very least, I suspect Bud was aware the actual levels were lower, perhaps not low enough for the level of success that they wanted, but at least low enough that the competition they'd hoped nuclear fire would have scarred from the earth was coming back. I mean, I can't imagine Rose was literally the only person who figured it out in over two centuries. But on the whole, for the average vault dweller, their information about the outside world is both outdated and limited. We saw this again with the Council while they were disciplining Norm. They seemed to think that the rad levels alone would be dangerous for Lucy. Also, the common people of the vault are under the impression that the exterior door had never been opened, though we know it's happened at least three times, when Rose left, when Hank left, and when he came back with Lucy and Norm. But overall, they're under the impression no one has ever went out, and it's not safe. It raises the question of how many times someone has left and then it's been covered up. Though in the case of Hank leaving, I think the plague Lucy mentioned probably acted somewhat as a means to disguise it all, especially given the quarantine that occurred. Very convenient that wasn't it? Their naivety really comes to a head, I think, with a discussion on the ultimate fate of the raiders. They're talking about educating them and rehabilitating them, reaching to find some redeemable characteristics about the people that literally murdered their friends and families. Lucy herself states to Magnus that they are naive, though I think this only became apparent to her upon leaving. She talks about the golden rule a few times, do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. I think this was introduced as just another means to control people, the goal was to create the best executives and managers to emerge on Reclamation Day and take over, so they'd be doing onto others all sorts they wouldn't want done onto themselves. But if, while in the vaults, they were very hesitant to take actions against others, then this would make them easy to control. If someone, such as, hypothetically speaking, a Vault 31 resident, was a cold piece of shit from before Armageddon took the world, then controlling all the people that actually stick to their ideals and principles of fairness and morality would be trivial. In fact, it likely played a large part in the experiment, as the residents in 31 were there to literally take charge once they had the perfect little workers. The meritocracy aspect was, as far as I'm concerned, simply a way to ensure that the people that you were moulding towards the ultimate workforce would have all the skill sets you needed once she came to take charge, but more than that, that they would see the concept of self-improvement to assist others and be of use as a worthy goal to pursue in their life. All of this so that they would all happily fall into the roles that, over generations, they were bred and engineered for. So now that we have the broad strokes of the place laid out, as well as some of the seeds of what was really going on behind the scenes, I think we're ready to dive in. We'll start by talking about the events that actually started all of this, the raid on Vault 33 by Moldaver. It gives us a lot of information regarding both the trade, the security practices, and lays the groundwork to discuss about what happened in Vault 32. And moreover, it also lets us discuss a lot of the confusion people had in regards to the whole event especially with regards to the points that a lot of people consider plot holes. So let's begin. 
This all occurred on the triangle exchange between the vaults. Either there was a different exchange for each vault with the other, or they were rotated, as we discussed. Regardless, Moldaver either knew about this beforehand, or got the information from the Overseer's terminal in Vault 32. Now as to how she got in, she used Rose's Pip-Boy. This is a point of confusion before we learned she had left the vaults and went to Shady Sands. Hank's response was to somehow detonate a nuke and take Lucy and Norm back, but Moldaver managed to get her hands on Rose's Pip-Boy. Now this is one of the first things people had issue with. How did she get into the vault? Generally speaking, just any Pip-Boy isn't capable of getting into a vault, or at least one that hasn't already failed and is still in operation. The Lone Wanderer, despite being from Vault 101 and having a Pip-Boy, was locked out on two different occasions. Moldaver, however, was able to unlock the exterior door with only Rose's Pip-Boy. However, we don't know exactly just what access she had. She was clearly a very intelligent woman, and she was able to open the exterior door in the first place. In the case of Lucy and Norm, they were unable to do this. The gatekeeper at the time, Chester, had to do it. This indicates that the unlocking of the doors between the vaults, or the exterior one, did indeed require special access likely given by the Overseer, or the Council. This also explains why Hank got a warning of an interval breach on his own Pip-Boy. However, he never received any warning for the exterior one. But if they are the ones that give access, then Rose could have taken it for her own Pip-Boy, and Hank, thinking her dead, never got around to revoking that access. Or given her intelligence, she just managed to subvert the security protocols in the first place. Maldiver also could have done it. It's hard to say exactly how involved she was in the Cold Fusion research. If it was very hands-on, then she's more than capable of hacking a vault given access to a Pip-Boy. If she wasn't, she still showed herself an intelligent and determined individual, and could have still managed it. Another point is that, given she was in contact with someone from the Enclave, she got access from them. They were the shadowy remnants of America, and could have been the individual sitting in the shadows during the meeting between Mr. House and the others at the end of the series. Faltek was closely tied to them. So Dr. Wilzig could have given her information, or even access, as he knew who Lucy was, and therefore must have known about Hank McLean as well. There is one point regarding the door access that is still tricky. Why she waited until the exchange? If she was able to get into the vaults, then she should have had no issues getting into 33. I can think of two reasons why she chose not to. The first is that, if they went in disguised as Vault 32 residents, then they could launch a surprise attack, which is exactly what happened. The second is that either the intervault doors are more difficult to open, or doing so would have alerted Hank and made their job much harder. We saw the ceremony for opening them still involve the gatekeeper, but it could be that a different process was used to open the exterior vaults as opposed to the interior doors, or the doors were only designed to be open at specific times, like the exchange. But since she was able to open it again to leave, without any other means, as far as we know, than a Pip-Boy, I think it's likely she was just waiting for the right time to strike. Another thing to note is that Norm needed Bud to let him into Vault 31, so at the very least, the intervault doors don't seem to be able to be accessed by just anyone. We saw this as well with where many of the Vault 32 residents met their end, unless of course Bud just had more control. One last thing to point out is why she waited so long after Hank had went back to the vault to do this. I think it's likely related again to Dr. Wilzig. She may not have known exactly where the vault was, though I find it hard to believe Rose didn't tell her, unless she simply wasn't sure whether she could trust Moldaver with that information yet. So from here, we need to jump into what happened with Vault 32, the Engineer Crisis, and the strange lack of communication between the Overseers, or the Vaults in general. When we first get a mention of Vault 32, it's from Hank, referring to the death of Overseer Jackson. Now he states he regretted to get their telegram regarding their death. What's unclear is whether or not the individual that we see strapped to the chair in the Overseer's office in Vault 32 was Overseer Jackson or was it their replacement? I.e., did the people there kill him, or did they die in the crop failure and their replacement was tortured and killed? If this was Overseer Jackson's replacement, then it makes sense why a telegram was sent to Hank. If, however, this was Overseer Jackson themselves, then I find it very unlikely, given everything that happened in Vault 32, that after killing him, they sent a telegram to Hank informing them that Overseer Jackson was dead, especially given the state the Overseer was in when Norm and Shet found them. Therefore, it was likely Moldaver, this makes sense as it appears that Hank and no one else in Vault 33 knew about what happened in Vault 32, or at least they knew they were all dead. This means that Moldaver must have arrived sometime before the exchange, posed as the new overseer, allowing her to trick Hank. Now I've seen a lot of debate around exactly how this all went on, so we know, from what Norm told Chester, that whatever happened in Vault 32 occurred two years ago, even before he had a chance to look at the biosigns or the entries. The decomposition made it clear that it had been some time, now, I'm not saying Moldaver has been there the whole time. 
I'm saying they just didn't communicate that frequently. Due to this, the two years of silence from Vault 32 were likely very typical, as any issues from there would be directed to Vault 31, the real power. We saw an example of this with an entry in 2095 from the presumed then overseer, Martin Johnson, with regards to repairs. Additionally, they were isolated so that when crisis and threats did emerge, it wouldn't spread. So it could very well have been the case that they'd just be expected to get on with it. Success in the face of something like this would mean that the type of people the experiment was trying to create, while failure simply indicated they deserved it. It is strange, however, that there's no verification procedure to ensure that she was in fact an elected overseer. But then again, Bud just assumed Norm was Betty and let him in. So maybe they just didn't think a total failure of the vaults was likely, and due to the voting system, a resident of Vault 31 would always be elected. Another possibility is Hank knew exactly what happened, but figured it was a situation that needed dealt with, and was confident in the ability of the people of his vaults. In fairness, this was a reasonable stance to take, as they did manage to either kill or imprison a very large contingent of the raiders, albeit with losses on their side, but that may not have been, in his eyes, a bad thing given the fact that he killed, or at least had a hand in killing, over 30,000 people, not to mention his wife. This isn't the first time he's been involved with a crisis in the vaults. Taking a bit of a sidetrack here from Vault 32 and 33, we need to talk about the population control that was going on here, and how they made sure that someone from Vault 31 was always elected. We get two mentions of crisis in Vault 33. The first is given to us when Lucy tries to convince Cooper not to eat Roger. She states that even during the plague of 2277, no one resorted to cannibalism. This is the same plague, mind you, that apparently killed Rose, which means it would have happened either during or after Hank returned with Lucy. People were quarantined to stop the spread, and the crops weren't being worked, so they started to starve. Now this itself is an interesting point, as it implies the plentiful nature of their supply of food wasn't as great as it first seems. We've already talked about this, but I think it confirms the pre-war food did need to be subsidized, to a certain extent, that the crops really were integral, and that maybe those supplies were part of the periodic group of supplies that was introduced into circulation by Vault 31. Regardless, a plague would have reduced their numbers. It also gave Hank a great cover story for why his wife died, and a way to stop people questioning where he went, as at the time he was the overseer. When Norm reads the record of 31 residents traded to 33, it stated his tenure was 2271 to 2296. This means he was already overseer for six years when the plague hit. However, we get information about another event as well from Davy, the man who ran against Hank. A weevil infestation hit the vault and damaged the crop, which would have been before the plague, as Hank was elected when it occurred. Again, another crisis that worked out for him. And this was the whole point. I believe the plague was introduced into the vault for three reasons. Population control and overseer elections, which are linked, and covering up Hank's disappearance. We pondered on why, even after all these centuries, the population hasn't reached a higher number, even with all the other ways they could control it. The answer is that, every few decades, a new overseer is elected. Now as Norm has pointed out, it is literally the case, at least as far as the evidence given to us, that a resident of another vault has never been elected as overseer. Not once. There are two possibilities here. Option A is there is some tampering going on. The votes are anonymous, so if they wanted to fix them or rig them, they could. However, someone could find out, and that would lead to all sorts of questions possibly the reason for the uprising in Vault 32, but more on that later. Option B is that, due to the subtle conditioning going on, the residents have been incepted with the idea that Vault 31 residents are just better, though under the impression the education system and facilities there are better than the other vaults. Additionally, over the past few centuries, every time something bad happens, a former Vault 31 resident is there to place a firm hand on the rudder and guide the vault back on course. We literally saw this just after Betty was elected, a crisis is introduced in the form of a damaged water chip. This puts a looming disaster over everyone and makes them more inclined to fall back on a Vault 31 candidate. I can't help but wonder if that entry from the previous overseer of Vault 33, Martin Johnson, was also an event that was used to incite panic and ensure a Vault 31 candidate succeeded them. The population control is obvious when you consider what these crises almost always involved. Scarcity and sickness. Two things to ensure that a portion of the vault dies off preventing the numbers from getting too high. It also meant that not only did the strongest survive, but also the most adaptable. The executives put in charge of the vault that are best suited for the role and had the best traits will be able to ensure the vault doesn't collapse and keep losses at an acceptable level where diversity wouldn't get so low that repopulation wouldn't be feasible. And even if that did happen, as in the case of Vault 32, where it was a total loss, the other vaults can simply migrate over to repopulate, as we saw the residents of Vault 33 do. 
Now, there is a chance that the plague was coincidental, but the fact that people had to isolate during it, which would have made Hank disappearing for an extended period of time fine, is too perfect, in my opinion. This could also be the case for the weight loss Lucy talked about. It was starvation, but due to him running out of supplies and barely making it back to the vault, not due to the lack of food as a result of the crops not being tended. There's also another option that the plague was the result of Rose opening the vault doors, but I can't really see how this could have spread all the way down. What I also don't think is the case is that this was a planned event. What I mean by this is that the introduction of a crisis to get Vault 31 overseers in place seems to be a constant play for management, but that had already happened. Just six years before the plague, the weevil crisis hit. Now, it probably wasn't as out of control or damaging, as that's only affecting the crops, while the plague was making people sick, which in turn affected the crops. Still, it was enough to get Hank elected, but this would have been enough. It likely also created some type of scarcity issues that either resulted in deaths or at least rationing. One answer is that, given Hank had to leave, then they needed a crisis to ensure someone else would be elected in his place and to compensate for the lack of results in population reduction from the weevils. Whatever the answer, it seems like it happened too soon after the previous one, which is why I think it wasn't planned. So management, i.e. Vault 31, were engineering crises to control the population, weed out the weak, and ensure former Vault 31 residents were elected. When the residents of Vault 33 are sent to repopulate 32, Stephanie was elected as interim overseer by the High Council, which must be Bod and Betty. This could mean she was always going to have been Hank's intended replacement. Hank was likely also brought in to replace Betty, as she was overseer before, and Hank had been one for over 20 years. So likely after a certain amount of time, they step aside, or she felt she was getting too old. This also occurred, as we know, by election, but the need for a 31 resident as overseer proved too great with Vault 32's repopulation. We know there aren't that many reactivated. From the logs in 31, only 7 were active at the time. Hank was gone, Jackson was dead, and Betty was already overseer. That leaves 4, and we don't know how many of them died in 32. So instead of the usual voting, Stephanie was put in power. But ordinarily, the process seems to have amounted to targeting infrastructure, or the resources, i.e. the crops. This is why I said they serve more than one purpose. It introduces a dependency that could be continuously exploited to achieve their goals. We know this seems to have been happening for over two centuries, with great success in regards to the goals of Vault 31. Which then begs the question, what the fuck happened in Vault 32? Vault 32 was kind of the first indicator we got that, despite appearances, this new trinity of vaults we were presented with wasn't breaking the mold of vault Tech shenanigans. It was actually fitting into it quite comfortably. When Norm first walks in, we see it as a kind of mirror of Vault 33, except it's all dead. The crop field is completely withered. Now one could argue this happened after the residents died, but I think, given the pattern we've discussed about the crops playing a key role in introduced crisis, that it was definitely before. As Norm made his way through, it was clear the vault was in a huge state of disrepair, though at this point he hadn't seen any bodies. We do find out where most of them were later, when he and Chet go back. The only body he found at this point was one with a leg missing inside what looked like a nursery ward. Now, the missing leg takes on new significance when we consider Lucy's comment about her vault not turning to cannibalism, and Cooper's disbelief that that was actually the case. Additionally, if we are assuming the crop failure played a role, then that leg could have been taken for food, which implies it had occurred after whomever that was had died, or been killed. Alternatively, they could have lost it during all the fighting that occurred in the vaults, and the blood loss resulting from said wound is what killed them. However, given where they are, the nursery, and the possibility of people having resorted to eating each other, it does raise the upsetting question of where the young ones are. Now, I could be wrong, and this wasn't a nursery ward of some description. Then it's likely that they simply suffered the same fate as many others here did, succumbing to the lack of resources due to the field crops. If that wasn't the case, well, I'm sure you can use your imagination to figure out what some people may have resorted to. Now, the real questions begin once Norm comes back with Chet. This time, we see far more of the vaults, and the remains of the people here. One of the first things that suggests there was infighting are the barricades we see set up throughout the vaults. Generally, it's the first thing to look for, after bodies, when assessing whether a vault has went to shit. Also, it implies that there were factions, or at least groups, given the large amount of them we see. The next thing are the deaths. Some of them are fairly benign looking deaths. Someone was murdered with a bar from a foosball table, which to me just speaks of the creativity of the murderer. However, after this, we start seeing the weird ones. The ones we wouldn't expect. We see that one person jammed a utensil into a toaster, resulting in them being electrocuted. It's odd as it implies they'd rather go out like that than deal with whatever the hell was happening in the rest of the vaults. But the really weird one is the two people that somehow strangled each other. I mean, I don't understand it at all. 
beyond it being put here specifically to leave us wondering what happened. The likelihood they'd both suffocate at the same time is just so remote. It makes you think if something else wasn't responsible for all of this. Next to them was someone who was either set on fire by someone else, or they did it to themselves. Scrawl beside them is the message, we know the truth. Now given the collapse of the vaults, the death of the overseer, and infighting, we can assume this means they actually figured out that Vault 32 was just being used as a breeding pool, and they were actually being controlled by 31. However, looking at the deaths here, and barricades, it still raises the question of why the people ended up like this. We also see that a lot of them decided to end it all by hanging, and that, along with a toaster and burnt body, implies that whatever truth they arrived at was one they couldn't live with. Either that, or they wanted to choose how they went out, as opposed to having it chosen for them. But this is strange, as if they did find out that they were being controlled, well, great, now they were in a position to do something about it. We find the overseer's door was wedged open, and they were tied to a chair. It looks like people broke into their office while they were trying to seal it, and tortured them for information. Eventually, they learned about management, Vault 31 presumably, given they scrawled death to them on the wall. But if they knew all of this, why didn't they just decide to govern themselves? Why didn't they warn 33? Well, I think, given what Chet and Norm find outside the doors of Vault 31, more than just a simple overthrowing of the Overseer happened. They find the rest of the residents at the end of a car door with barricades set up. Behind those barricades, in front of the Vault 31 door, are the bodies. A huge pile of bodies that are just as decomposed as the rest, implying that whatever happened, happened in a short frame of time. Written on the wall is, we know what's in there. Additionally, a lot of tools are scattered around the door near the bodies, and it definitely has signs that they were attempting to breach it. But this leaves a few questions. What happened to them, and everyone else? What did they think was in there, and why were there barricades? Well, we need to first talk about what likely started all this. We've talked about the crops being used to control people. I see no reason why this wasn't the case here. I think that it was a crop failure, but engineered like the weevils and the plague. However, something different happened this time. Somehow, people find out about what happened. Now this could have played out a few ways. The first option is the crops failed, and the vault was incapable of bouncing back this time. Overseer Jackson passed away, and someone else was brought in to replace them. Now given the torture, they'd have to have been from Vault 31. Or else, why would the people turn against them like this? If they were from Vault 32, then it's more likely they would have told everyone the truth. Not have it extracted from them, unless they felt some sense of loyalty and hid it. So a 31 resident was elected, someone from the list Norm had seen, but maybe this time people didn't vote for them. Maybe this time enough people realized it didn't make sense. This is where the possibility that we discussed earlier of the votes being rigged comes in. The 31 resident was elected, and it didn't add up. People found out, and from here they figured out the rest. Alternatively, they were elected under normal circumstances of people voting 31 in a crisis, and then they just turned against them. Driven mad by the deteriorating conditions. We saw on the TV when Norman Chet went in that a show describing an experiment with trap mice was playing, describing how they kill and eat each other when they run out of food. Robert House actually made the same observation during the meeting, and an experiment was suggested by Big MT to get people to compete for resources as well. So it's not like this was an unforeseen scenario. Option 2 is Overseer Jackson was simply overthrown, then tortured and killed. But given that these crises seem to have been a recurring pattern, things must have been incredibly dire for her to get to that stage. After either he or another overseer was overthrown, the people knew the truth. They knew they were being used as breeders for the junior executives. They knew the hardships they were subjected to were engineered to call their numbers and ensure they could be controlled. So they decided enough was enough. They rose up. Now given we saw barricades, people ending it themselves, and people literally choking each other to death, clearly not everybody was in agreement. Perhaps, for some, the condition in brainwashing was too great. Between their great mission of saving the world, and the golden rule, they couldn't allow it all to collapse. So there was infighting. Likely they wanted to stop those trying to break into Vault 31, as this was where the last vestiges of the old world, in their opinion, were housed. Those who could repopulate and rebuild. Those trying to break into 31 seemed to try and fight them off, to varying stages of success. But in the end, they weren't victorious. They were all killed. Then, those who presumably did the killing, those loyal to the original goal of reclamation, ended it themselves. It's also likely that the horror of what they had done played a role as well. These people had been their neighbors, their friends. Shit, probably their family. They knew the vault was finished, as management would never just let them go to Vault 33 with this information. So they went out, on their own terms. Now there is another option. Something drove them to this, chemical or otherwise. 
Now, we haven't really seen any evidence for this, apart from an offhand comment about drugging a vault to see what would happen by Frederick Sinclair of Big MT. Also, you know, years and years of evidence of vault -Tec doing the same thing in other vaults to a lot of people. Though ordinarily that was the actual experiment, not just something introduced as a contingency. Though these three vaults were obviously a special case. If this was the case, then this may have been a contingency by Bud to wipe the vault clean. But then this leaves several issues, like if Bud knew about all of this, why was Vault 32 only cleaned and reused after the Raider attack? And why he never informed Hank that he needed to literally purge half the genetic pool of the vault? Another option is that robots were used to kill them all, at least those by the door, given how many were piled up. But it didn't look like any of those in front of the vault door had been moved, so this raises the question of where the robots would have came from. Secret compartments? Also, Lucy, when she encountered a Mr. Codsworth unit, seemed surprised by what it was. So the vaults actually had robots anywhere in them. I feel like she'd not have reacted this way. Unless we just chalk that up to her just expecting something else, as she'd at least have learned about them. But they weren't shown to us inside the vaults. No, I think if we want to speculate on if there was another cause, for now, we'll need to wait for more information. The last thing I want to talk about in regards to the uprising here is the motivation for breaking in the Vault 31. If it was only to get to those stored in cryogenics, then it was revenge. They felt they couldn't recover, and they wanted to take those in 31 down, as opposed to dying and letting them come in and start it all over again. They also would have known that they couldn't go to Hank, as he was from Vault 31, and would likely have just left him to starve, and then later say that Vault 31 had made him aware of a terrible tragedy. At that point, they'd likely just do what Betty did, and send in the 33 residents to repopulate. Betty actually states that agreeability was a criteria when they selected people to place into 32, so maybe they wanted to make sure that this time around, the people were even easier to control. But there's also the possibility it wasn't for revenge, or at least not completely. You've probably already thought about it, especially when I brought up the possible stockpiling of resources by Vault 31, and only slowly reintroducing them to create scarcity. When Norm gets trapped by Bud Askins, he says there isn't much in the way of supplies in the vault, given that 31 residents left when they were woke up. But honestly, I find this unlikely. If something happened with the other vaults, they need a way to restock them or get them back on track. Keeping enough resources for those in 31, if they had to be woken up all at once, makes a lot of sense. Also, we are literally told in the terminal logs that resources did go into 31. Sometimes people as well, though they may have been former Vault 31 residents. Really, if as much ceremony existed every time someone from the vaults was treated, as we saw from 32 and 33, the only explanation is they woke people up to do the trade. But as far as we can tell, this did occur, if for no other reason than to keep up appearances. Therefore, the vault had to have some resources. This may have been the goal of those who tried to break in, to get the supplies they needed to survive. Supplies they traded away with the assumption they'd be put to good use, not shoved into a corner by a fucking Roomba. The final thing is one of the other points I've seen people really debate over. How was Vault 32 cleaned? When Betty decides to bring the other vault dwellers into it, it's pristine. Yes, there is some evidence, like a spot of blood on the foosball table, but apart from that, a very good job was done overall. This is despite the level of dust, dirt, blood, bodies, barricades, and general damage to the vault. True, we're never actually shown the Vault 31 entrance again, but on the whole, it seems it was cleaned very well. Additionally, to do this would have required the supplies to repair it and restock it with enough food, as the crop fields, as far as we know, were still not ready. Now, there's a few possibilities here. The first, and least likely in my opinion, is that the reactivated Vault 31 residents did it. From the entry norm scene, there was only seven, counting Hank and Overseer Jackson. Even assuming that 32 had no other active Vault 31 residents apart from the Overseer, that's only five people to clean it out. And Betty, now his Overseer, would have too many responsibilities. Four people are not enough, unless way more time has passed than we're led to believe. Even then, they'd all need the skill sets to repair the vaults. Now, they could have enlisted other people to help. This is a little more believable. Yes, there is still a problem of what to do with all the stuff related to the truth of the vaults. But really, if you just scrub them off the walls, maybe shifted a few bodies around, it's doable. That wouldn't explain why the bodies were so old, as the company line seemed to be the Raiders did it all. But at least it's a little more likely than only four people doing it for a structure that housed hundreds. Cleaning a lot of those rooms would be a full day job, and there's hundreds of them. The other option is Vault 31. Some people could have been woken up, told to get to work, and then go back to sleep. However, unless certain people were set aside literally for a situation like this, I doubt this would go well. Presumably, there was a bit of a period to prepare people after they'd woken up, and get them used to the new vault life and up to speed, before sending them out. 
Waking up a lot of them at once and asking them to clean an enormous structure full of decomposing bodies seems like a tall order. Moreover, even though they had all went through Bud Askin's assistant training program, there's a limit. If you woke up to find that everything had went pear-shaped, you'd likely have questions and misgivings about the overall feasibility of the vaults, not to mention Bud as a Roomba. I also think they'd be apprehensive about going back to sleep. I mean, you open the doors, and there's a pile of bodies of people whose last breath was used to break into the room with the equipment keeping you alive. You'd maybe be a little reluctant to go to sleep again. Option 3. Robots. Just like with the possible killing of some of the Vault 32 residents. We haven't seen any of these robots, excepting Bud, and we saw that he isn't particularly effective in combat. There does seem to be a bit of a joke reference that Bud did the cleaning, but we'll get to that. So yes, like with the ultimate cause of all the deaths and violence, we don't have enough information. You'll just have to take your own thoughts, and maybe what I've presented, and make up your mind yourself. So now that we've covered 32 and 33, all that's left is a flesh out 31, Bud Askins, the overall goal of the vaults, and how this relates to some of the other plot points in the series. Shortly after we're introduced to Bud Askins, we learn that he left West Tech and was currently involved, as he put it, in HR R&D. Now this sounds like a nonsense job, but the title fits in perfectly with what he does. He was researching new techniques of management and human relations, specifically those over a long time scale. As he puts it, workflow optimization of management timelines, or how to manage people and resources more effectively to achieve goals that are not achievable in the human lifespan due to the presence of the true apex predator, time. The vaults, or at least his trinity of vaults, were his answer to this. Nothing stated that he created the vault program. So for now, the most we can contribute to him is the trinity with its proposed solution and the outreach to the other large companies at the time. He decided that if humanity was to survive, and as he puts it, win the great game of capitalism, then it required a new technique of management, and the right people, to implement it on a much larger timeline than the human lifespan. Those to manage it would be those who graduated his assistant training program. Their timeline, relative to everyone else's, would be extended by cryogenically preserving them, allowing them to leapfrog through time. Vaults 33 and 32 were used as breeding pools, to allow the genetics of these desirable individuals to propagate through time as well. Additionally, it would give them a workforce that they could mold and shape, turning them into the types of managers and workers that could achieve the goal of outlasting the competition, i.e. the rest of humanity, and winning the great game of capitalism. When Norman counters Bud Askins in Vault 31, he's a bargain bin version of a Robobrain. Now to be honest, I have no idea why he went with this. Canonically, the technology for creating Robobrains existed in a fairly stable state in 2077. We've encountered them, albeit a bit demented, many times on both coasts. As Bert explained to us in Vault 118, mentally they degrade over time. He theorized that giving them their original voice staved this off, but that's all covered in my Vault 118 video if you want to take a look. But what we do know is that he himself was capable of placing himself and several others in Robobrain platforms just before the war, and they're still in one piece, kind of. Because of this, given their ties to Rob Coe in the military, I don't understand why Bud wasn't given a full Robobrain body, unless of course he has one somewhere, and he just wasn't in it when Norm showed up. This could imply he actually was the one to clean the vaults. This is kind of alluded to when Norm meets him. He's managed to get stuck behind him up. If such a simple thing is capable of trapping him, it's hard to believe it hasn't happened at any other point in the past two centuries. This could mean that he does have a better body, that this brain case Roomba-like one can hook into. Also, if anyone is watching this and is wondering why I haven't commented on why he's a brain, it's because it's ordinary. Over the years, we've seen this a lot in Fallout, and him doing it to preserve his life so he can act as the manager or executive over his junior executives makes perfect sense to me. We do know that he can interface with the vault to some extent, as he was able to send messages and he could lock the door on Norm, as well as open the Vault 31 door and wake people up. But all of that seems to have needed the little cubby or dock he was inside in that room at the time. That he never tried to call for help when he was stuck behind the mop backs this up. That the mop was there gives more credibility, as we discussed, to either himself or someone else from the vault, having clean 32, but we still can't be sure. The last thing, at least tangentially related to the vaults, is the clandestine meeting, outsourcing the experiments and the expenses to several other companies in exchange for funding. The other companies were Big MT, West Tech, Repcom, and of course, Robco. More specifically, Mr. House. I already have a video talking about him, although now it may need to be updated. Suffice to say, I think it's reasonable to conclude this canon timeline has him surviving the courier. Additionally, the credits at the end showed cryo facilities in the Tops Casino. This is likely how Moldaver survived, but again, a whole other video there. What we do get is several pieces of information to have, going forward. 
The first is Voltec's role in the end of the world. We actually got confirmation of them not being happy, with the peace talks from the two chaps having a conversation on the couch at Cooper's party. We already know they went to extreme lengths to ensure that peace wouldn't be achieved. All of this was over energy, remember. Resources. So when Moldaver actually achieved cold fusion, they mothballed that pretty quickly. If that had got out, even taking ideological issues into account, the war would be over. So they were already all in at this point. So much so that they decided the risk of peace was too great, and they needed to ensure it would never come to pass by totally removing it as an option. Barb outright states that Voltec had the intention at the time to drop the bombs. Now given we know that Hank had access to nuclear ordnance to use on Shady Sands, it makes me wonder if they did all of it, i.e. did they take control of all the other countries' nukes, or did they use just a few, a few strategically placed ones, to make everyone believe the end of the world was on and cause the rest to be launched. This seems more likely to me. Alternatively, they just took steps to ensure the peace talks failed, and then she just meant they'd be the cause of them failing. Regardless, it's a solid addition to the canon, as it was always debated who really caused it. And yeah, I know, we know about the Zayton alien race. Not a huge fan of that DLC to be honest, so until we get more backing it up these days, I don't buy it. The other thing we do get is information that's, well, not exonerates, because that's too strong a word, but at least somewhat negates some of the blame on vault -Tech about the vault conditions. From the other companies we get the following ideas. Overcry the vaults to cause a competition for resources. Let a robot govern the vaults. Use FEV on immigrants to make super mutant soldiers. Psychotropics in the air supply. Separate all the children from their parents, and presumably kill off all, but the most capable. Lots of really good ideas, folks. Ideas that are very much in line with certain vaults we've covered in the past. So something to keep in mind for now until we discuss it all again. But it does seem to indicate the vaults that we looked at and thought, how in the wide blue fuck was this ever meant to succeed or work? May have been in this category. Or at the very least, not all of them were due to vault -Tec. Now what actual benefit some of these scenarios would give you, even from a purely data point of view, I can't say. Especially the psychotropic one. Given Barb's comment to Cooper about wanting to get into a good vault, and given what we've discussed, I don't believe we can classify 32 and 33 as such, then there had to have been other vaults that would classify as good. Indeed, in the games we do get information regarding other control vaults, or vaults related to vault tech management. This implies to me that while Bud may have thought of this as the one true vault to win the game, to vault tech, it was just another wager. We also see no evidence in Bud's chamber that he was overseeing the other vaults at all. However, the fact that Dr. Wilsig knew the details about the vaults and likely directed Moldaver there, we can assume that, if this control vault is still knocking around, the Enclave are involved, to one degree or another. So this, overall, is the full story of vaults 31, 32, and 33, at least that we know so far, the brainchild of Bud Askins. This was his answer to humanity surviving Armageddon and overcoming the true apex predator, time, that would lay waste to all others. He trained up a bunch of junior executives and took them along with a larger group, whom we don't know the selection criteria of, and went to vaults 31, 2, and 3. His executives were stored in cryopods and over the centuries, periodically woken up. This was done to allow them to take charge of either vault 33 or 32 and do what they've been trained to do, manage to execute Bud Askin's vision that required time scale exceeding the human lifespan. They'd wait out the end of the world, and when the competition had been killed off, they'd emerge, effectively winning capitalism. To ensure that the pre-war residents would always be elected and to deal with overpopulation, various crises were engineered and set in motion in the two vaults, be those crop failures, plagues, or other scenarios that would not only cause death, but also uncertainty. Uncertainty that would then be exploited to manipulate people into voting how they wanted them to, it was also used as a kind of coal, to remove those deemed too weak to survive. Another feature of these vaults, and how all this really started, was the interval trade. We've discussed it at length, but it served the purpose of exchanging breeders and necessities. Necessities that were otherwise limited or controlled in some manner, given the talks of famine and scarcity. They did seem to be well supplied, so we have concluded that Vault 31 was introducing resources into circulation. But slowly enough, the vaults never had too much, and would still need to depend on the trade to get by, ensuring the unity continued and that they followed instructions. However, one of the two vaults didn't do this. In fact, it went off the rails in much the same way we've seen in many other vaults before. The residents are all dead. The crop is dead. The overseer is dead. Everybody died. The details of it are sketchy. Some did it to themselves. Some did it to others. And some, like the huge pile of bodies, are a little harder to determine. Perhaps external tampering from Bud. We don't have enough information yet. 
What is clear is that, somehow, whether due to the vote tampering being brought to light, or the people finally breaking under an engineer crisis, they attacked the overseer and overthrew them. Then they tried to get access to Vault 31. Some kind of infighting seems to have occurred, whether from those still loyal to the overall goal of the vaults, or just due to the desperation. But it tore the vault apart, leaving it long dead, before Moldaver showed up. When we were first introduced to Vault 33, we were hopeful and apprehensive. We've seen time and time again that, even if the surface of the vault is calm, beneath it, dangers lurk. Today, as we've seen, this sadly is the case. These people, like so many others we've seen, were just being subjected to the whims of vault -Tec. Though in this case, I suppose, you could argue that at least their vault was meant to succeed. What's become clear is that many of the other experiments were literally just, let's see what happens if we do X, conducted by many of the most powerful corporations in the world. But vault -Tec still let it happen, so they're still guilty, as far as I'm concerned. What the future holds for this trinity, we don't know. Norm is trapped in Vault 31, and Chet is a coward, now stuck in 32. So unless he steps up, or Lacey returns, no one will know the truth. The truth that, at any time, management might decide to shake things up, to test just how capable the people in the vault are, and to get rid of the weak. The truth of how they're all just pieces in a larger machine, a machine designed to persist through the ages, survive the apex predator, time, and to achieve and execute the long-term plans and goals of Bud Askins, the HR guru who now resides in a discount robo-brain.